All right. Welcome back, everybody. Getting ready to kick this next session off. Going to give a few minutes to actually tip over into the next session officially and uh, see if we get a few more people to pop in here. Did anybody actually check out the expo during the break? You can you can respond in the chat if you are interested. No expo visitors. Anybody try the uh, chat relay networking thing? Natter is in the house. Yeah, let's do a, let's do a quick uh, call out. So while uh, we get everything set up here, uh, quickly a message where uh, where you're watching from. I'm I'm viewing from Germany. Any, what else we got? Argentina, nice Raleigh. Cupertino, Los Angeles. West Coast coming in strong. Nice. Okay, so uh, we are official at the next start here, and we're going to run a tight ship today. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Um, Natter, you can actually request to share your screen there, uh, and you'll be able to hop in because I think you have moder moderator rights. Hey, there he is. So I'm going to hand it straight over to you. Um, really <clears throat> to have you talking today, and uh, super excited what you're what you're going to bring today. So everybody, cool. Here's Natter. Hey, so you can hear me all right? All right, good, good. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. I get to uh, be involved in some cool events, and this one in particular interests me because I'm a big fan of of dealing with uh, APIs in general, and of course GraphQL is kind of what I've been specializing in lately, even though I'm also doing a lot of interesting stuff with uh, serverless REST APIs. Um, but with, with GraphQL, I think I'm seeing um, a lot of adoption in the enterprise, which is really, really fascinating to me to see. Uh, you know, it's not even a new technology anymore. It's kind of like mature at this point. But um, I think at first you kind of didn't see as much enterprise adoption as you're seeing now. Um, and, and a lot of the tooling and stuff that my team has been working on is kind of trying to lower the barrier to entry uh, to kind of uh, allow people to start building, you know, using that enterprise level of architecture. And that's really kind of what my talk is about today. Um, so I guess without further ado, I'll just go ahead and uh, pull up my slide deck. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead and get started on my talk. Uh, so my talk is called Transforming GraphQL. And uh, it's kind of going to be talking about full stack cloud tooling with GraphQL, uh, full stack cloud for front end developers is kind of my subtitle here. Um, it's also, I kind of pitch it as infrastructure as GraphQL sometimes because uh, it's kind of, um, you know, it is, that's kind of what it does. It allows you to deploy uh, cloud infrastructure using GraphQL directives. So uh, let me go ahead and kind of give an outline of my talk. It's gonna be broken up into four main parts. I'm gonna do an intro into, uh, you know, myself, but also into, kind of the technology that I'm gonna be using for this talk. Then I'm gonna do some uh, data modeling as far as kind of uh, showing how you can- Hey, Natter. Um, hey, yes. We, we don't see your slides yet. Oh, you don't see my slides yet, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me go ahead and, um, I just started sharing this. So let's try this one more time. <laughs> just thought I'd catch you early. As, uh, uh, what about Beautiful. now? Uh, okay, looks cool. good. Yes. Yeah, this is my title slide, um, and that kind of went over, you know, just kind of what what am I be talking about? But uh, yeah, this is the uh, the outline of my talk. So yeah, that we're going to do that that intro. We're going to be then going into the data model of uh, kind of using transforms to do different things. <clears throat> then I'm going to do a live demo, and we're going to rapidly prototype an API, and then I'm going to show uh, just one live example because I think this talk doesn't have uh, enough time for me to show multiple, but I'm going to show uh, one example of something that I built really quickly that scaled really impressively and uh, just kind of talk about how that was built. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, my name is Natter Davitt. I'm a software engineer and author. I do a lot of open source. And uh, currently, I'm a developer advocate on the AWS mobile team, which is essentially uh, composed of AWS Amplify and AWS AppSync. Um, the most recent book that I've just finished is called Full Stack Serverless, and it's available via O'Reilly Publications. And it's uh, going to be talking about a little bit of the stuff that I'm talking about in, in this talk, but it's really about building full stack cloud apps using React, GraphQL, and AWS. So the team that I work on is AWS Amplify, and um, our focus is really around building full stack cloud tooling and uh, SDKs and libraries. And we have kind of things that we're really focused on. Uh, one is developer velocity. So we are really interested in being able to allow developers to kind of, uh, you know, take things that were traditionally really hard to do and really tedious and really time consuming and make them efficient and make them um, accessible and make them fast. And also just the idea of being able to build quickly and experiment quickly um, kind of sets you apart a lot of times in the, in the industry. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next point, uh, experimentation. Um, along with developer velocity comes experimentation because you're able to, if you're fast and, and cheap and without a lot of overhead, you're able to experiment more and you're able to try things out and you're able to kind of test out things and see if they work and move on if they don't and if they do continue to iterate and improve on those, which will, again, kind of set you apart in the industry and allow you to, um, you know, before just build faster but also um, be able to innovate, um, innovate better. Um, along with uh, this kind of, this idea of affordability, I kind of uh, would say really is a result of the serverless philosophy. And a lot of the tools that we introduce are serverless. And uh, affordability can mean a lot of different things, but in a sense of um, what I'm talking about, I guess, is going to be the idea of paying per compute so when you're building out a service, uh, you're not paying for it until you hit some some type of scale. So let's say you have uh, an authentication service or a GraphQL API. Uh, you're really not paying for that API until you have some decent scale of usage. So it's essentially free until you actually get users is the idea. But it's also a more affordable in the sense that you don't actually have to build it from scratch. You can actually just take advantage of a service that's already been built and that is there for your usage and you can just start using it right away without having to build it from scratch every time you need something. We're really interested in lowering the barrier to entry to cloud computing. A lot of the people that start uh, with Amplify have never used any cloud services before. Um, they've always maybe looked at AWS or uh, other cloud you know, providers and thought that it was, it was kind of like too tough for them to kind of understand how to use. A lot of our focus is taking the existing services and all of these really scalable backend uh, architectures and making them accessible to anyone that understands how to kind of just work with APIs in general. So if you if you know how to uh, to interact with an API from a client side application, we want to make the cloud um, accessible to you. And out of the box scalability is kind of a, another result, I guess you could say, of philosophy um, and the the proper configurations around these services also is very important here because um, you know depending on on that configuration is going to depend on whether or not your your backend scales and everything works properly together and really kind of the ideas here is like we're, we want to make it to where if you are a developer and you want to use the same infrastructure that these massive companies are using. Um, and you want all of the benefits that those things offer, we want to make that easy for you to do, not just accessible, but easy. To be so easy that it's easier to build on this scalable infrastructure than it is to build on some other option that doesn't even scale as well. So that's kind of our, that's our, those are our core tenants. Um, and when I say full stack, full stack cloud tooling and libraries, like what do I mean? Well, Amplify is kind of made up of three main parts. And the two on the left, uh, the client and the CLI are the two main ones I'm going to be focused on on today. The CLI allows you to uh, create and configure directly from your front end environment. So you, you might initialize a new project with a NIT, and then you might add a GraphQL API with add API. You might make an update with update, and then you might deploy those uh, updates with push. 
And then what you end up getting from this is uh, that full stack cloud infrastructure. You're, so you're, when I say full stack, we're actually doing code generation on the client, but also deploying that cloud infrastructure. So for instance, in a GraphQL, um, uh, a, a GraphQL app, you know, we're talking about GraphQL here, uh, that client side code might be the GraphQL queries and mutations that you would need for a type, TypeScript project, or they might be those queries and mutations you would need for a native iOS project. And then the cloud infrastructure would be deployed uh, to go along with that. So you know, when you're running these commands, we're generating stuff not only on the, the back end, but also on the front end. Um, and then the client libraries allow you to then interact with those services. So in the sense of GraphQL, you deploy your API, and then we actually have three different GraphQL clients that you can use. So if you've ever used Apollo, that's that's a that's a GraphQL client um, that Apollo has, and then we also have our own clients. But you can also use uh, third-party libraries as well. But you might import the API category from Amplify. You would import your operation, uh, like in this example, uh, list to do query. And then you would just use the API category to make that call against your API. Um, and we also support a bunch of other categories as well that we're not really going to be talking about today, like authentication and stuff. Uh, the main category we're talking about uh, where GraphQL transform kind of fits in is this API category. Um, part of that tooling is this GraphQL transform library. Essentially, infrastructure is GraphQL. And you, you hear this idea of infrastructure as code when you talk about cloud computing, and it's essentially just taking a file, writing out some, some key value pairs. It could be YAML, it could be JSON. And then you kind of use that file and deploy, and you have this infrastructure. But what if we want to abstract that a level higher and make it even easier? That's kind of where, where we see GraphQL transform coming in. <clears throat> Let's talk about why you, we would need something like this. Uh, if you've ever built a GraphQL API from scratch, you kind of understand uh, how tedious it is. And you understand why services like AppSync, like Hasura, like uh, all these other uh, GraphQL as a service providers are there in the first place, because you don't want to be you don't want to be out there building your database every time you need an API, uh, you know. For especially if you if you're just kind of if, if you're a startup or you're trying to really conserve costs and uh, you don't know for sure the thing that you're building, even if it's even going to work, you don't want to spend a, a six months building something as a prototype. <clears throat> So like, uh, yeah, so you're building your API, you need your database, you need your your, your uh, server, you need your schema, you need your resolvers, it all has to work together. You then need to worry about stuff at scale. You have to worry about what happens if you get 10, 20, 50 million connected users. What happens if, you're, if they're all using a GraphQL subscription? Uh, how does that work? You have to understand how to implement stuff around uh, malicious queries, security, author authorization, authentication. Um, making all of that work together and at scale is a hard problem to solve. And I think that's a really, the core benefit of using these serverless technologies is you're all floating this complexity to a team of specialists who've spent years just on this single, simple use case, a single use case. So um, you, you kind of, the idea of serverless philosophy, you, you reach out and you grab these managed, managed services when possible, and you only are focused on uh, building out your own um, business value uh, or, or differentiating services or features that, that other, uh, you know, they, uh, the other competitors might not have. Um, so when you're building out this API, you need all this stuff, but you also need additional things around your API. So you might need a way to model relationships between data. You need rules around auth. You need to do stuff um, around different data access patterns, all of these different things. Um, and that's kind of where the GraphQL transform library comes into play. And the idea is this, you kind of, uh, you take your GraphQL schema, um, which would be a, a typical schema, for example, a type of to-do for a to-do app. And then you would uh, add these directives and you essentially kind of run what is kind of like a build process. And the build process can be done either locally to for testing or when you're deploying. And what you end up getting infrastructure based on that schema. And some of the different transforms that we currently support um, are, are listed here. The ones that we're going to be talking about are going to be at model, um, at auth, and at connection, and I think also at function. Um, and we'll, we'll we'll walk through exactly what those do actually next. So uh, the at model, what this allows you to do is take a, a basic type, and this will scaffold out the database table, the resolvers, and CRUD operations and subscriptions for you for any type. So what you end up getting for, for instance, a product type 
would be a create product, update, delete, and list product uh, GraphQL operations. You would also get subscriptions for on create, on update, and on delete. You would get a DynamoDB table. DynamoDB is one of the most scalable databases that are that's out there. It's, it's something that Netflix and even Amazon uses at scale. Um, you also get the GraphQL resolvers that map between those operations and the database. So you would get you know all those operations. You would get that database, and it would all kind of be mapped together. And then what you would then do if you have any logic that you need to write, you would just be able to just update your resolver. Um, the at connection is a transform that allows you to define many uh, to many relationships, many to one relationships, uh, one to many, any type of relationship. So imagine a post with a, uh, a comment on a post. You want to be able to model a relationship between a comment and a post. So when someone creates a comment, you're able to query the post and the comments together in a single operation. All you need to do is just uh, add this app connection, and you can even extend that with additional arguments for uh, more complex areas. Uh, the next one is the, the at auth directive, and this allows you to define an array of authorization rules. So for a really basic use case, you might think of a situation where you only want the owner to be able to uh, update, delete, or even read. Uh, for that, you would just pass in the single argument, allow owner. But in reality, most uh, APIs have multiple access patterns. So for instance, something like Instagram or Twitter or even uh, Medium or some type of blog, where you want the owner to have uh, full access, They're, they should be able to update, delete, and everything. But you only want uh, the public to be able to read. They shouldn't be able to do anything else. Maybe they can leave comments, but they can't actually update the post itself. Here, you would just pass in an array of roles. You would pass in the allow owner. And then you would also allow public with an array of operations set to only read. And then the last one I'll go over is the function resolver uh, or the function transform on uh, a resolver. And this, uh, any query or mutation and map it into a Lambda function, the return value of that Lambda function is the return value of the query or the mutation. So for this example, we're mapping uh, two arguments, number one and number two, and this is expected to return an integer. And all this does is map those two arguments into a Lambda function. Whatever you return from that Lambda function is the return value here. So it's really simple to add a function and do any anything in that function, right? You could talk to a database. You could talk to another API, another service. You could even uh, integrate this into a microservice architecture. And actually, we have one more we'll go over that is really um, important, I guess, in the idea, in the sense of a microservice architecture. Uh, you can actually map a request directly to another REST API by using the at HTTP resolver. So this would allow you to kind of take any um, REST API you already have out there and turn your GraphQL API into a truly uh, API, into a true API gateway where you just have all of your operations coming in as GraphQL operations. And if you have uh, some other HTTP endpoints out there that you haven't migrated over to GraphQL yet, you could uh, just do that um, using this at HTTP uh, transform. So now that we kind of understand that, I want to do a live, a live demo where we kind of scaffold out an API. What I want to do is uh, I want to have an API with a couple of different types. I want to have all the schema that goes along with that. So create, read, update, delete. Um, I want to have a database, a databases for both types or tables for both types. Um, I want to have the resolvers for all the operations mapping to the database. I want to have relationships. So I want to have a one-to-many relationship and then I want to have auth rules. And I might even go even further than that. One more thing where we're enabling additional data access patterns using the at key directive. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into this demo. So here I have a uh, Amplify project. And what I want to do is I want to add this GraphQL API. So to do that, we can just run Amplify add API. And here we'll the type of API, I want to choose GraphQL. We could also have choose, uh, chosen REST. I'll give the API a name. Um, we can now choose uh, multiple authorization types. And by and then you'll need to set a default, though. So like uh, the default request setting up on your client would be this default authorization type. Um, I'll just choose API key for now, because um, we're going to add another authorization type in just a moment. And to do that, I will say I want to make additional changes, and I'll configure an additional auth type. And this is user pool. 
And this is uh, essentially just a managed authentication service, something like uh, Auth0. And even if uh, you have Auth0, you could actually go down and choose um, Open ID Connect, and this will allow you to bring any authentication provider that you would like via o OIDC. So, uh, but for, for me, I have already configured Cognito by running Amplify at Auth, and I can just use that. If we had a client that needed um, offline access, we could choose conflict detection, yes, but we don't. So I can just choose no. Um, if we had a schema that we wanted to, to, to reference, we could reference that, but I don't. Um, so instead, I'm going to choose the guided schema creation, and this is just going to give us a few boilerplates. So I'll go ahead and edit the schema now. And by default, we're going to get like a, a single type of to do, but I want to create a uh, a post type similar to what I was talking about earlier, like a Twitter type app or an Instagram type app. And the, this app is going to have a post and a comment. Uh, we're going to add the at model directive to give us the CRUD operations in the database. I'll go ahead and give both of these an ID. And then we can start thinking about the other fields that we need. Um, so for a post, I might have something simpler, something simple like uh, content. And for the content, I might have a message. And what we want to do now is have uh, posts associated with a comment. So I might say comments, add the um, at connection. And that will have a relationship between posts and comments. The next thing I will the authorization rules. So I'll add at auth, and I'll pass in uh, an array of rules. And each of these rules will have a key value pair um, for the allow. So the first one is going to be allow owner. And this is going to uh, automatically assign a, um, a user ID to the, um, the mutation that is going to be read off of the JWT, the, the JSON web token. I'll also say uh, allow public. I want anyone to be able to uh, read. So I can say operations uh, read. So here we have um, two rules. We're saying we want the owner to be able to create, read, update, delete, do everything. But the public is uh, going to only be able to uh, query like with a get item or a list, a list query. The next one we want to do is uh, allow private, because we want to say also if someone is uh, not a public user, meaning that they are signed in, but they're not the owner, we also want them to be able to. And something else that's interesting is by default, when you when you pass allow owner, it's going to set a field, um, or it's going to set a um, an item in your database with the owner that's read off of that JWT. Now, if we ever want to read that, we could actually go ahead and say like something like author, and set that that field here, and then we can specify that in our um, mutation we want to set the owner field to to reflect off of one of our fields. So I could say owner field author. And what we can do also, considering that the post and the comment probably have similar uh, authorization rules, we can just actually copy and paste that here. So we want the same rules for a comment. Um, and then I can also set the uh, author as a string. Okay, cool. So um, we have all that going on. So we should be able to do uh, create posts and then create a comment on a post. Um, the last thing I might want to do is we might want to have a field of something like category. And we might want to be able to query posts uh, by category. So to do that, we can actually add additional data access patterns by using the at key. And here we're going to set <clears throat> the uh, fields array. And this is going to take uh, an array of these uh, GraphQL fields off of our type. So the field that we want to query on is category. So this is going to allow us to say, OK, we want to get posts by category. Um, and then we need to set the uh, query field, because this is going to actually create a new GraphQL query for us. And we can say posts by category. And then the last thing we want to do is uh, we have to define what's going to be essentially the name of this query, uh, I'm sorry, the name of this um, key. And this doesn't really matter, so I'll just call this uh, category um, post field or something like that. 
I just call this category post. That's fine. Okay, cool. So we have now this tested out or this uh, this created. So how do we actually test this out? So I can go now to my CLI. Um, and I can actually deploy this if I would like and test it out live. But I can also test it out locally uh, just by running Amplify Mock. This is going to go ahead and introspect our schema. And it's going to go ahead and make sure it's valid. And if it is, it's going to read our directives. And it's going to create the, the database tables uh, locally for us. So we're going to see that we have a post table and a comment table. It's also going to do GraphQL code generation uh, in whatever language we like. And this is for a client app. So if we had like a client app we wanted to use, um, we could do that. We could use this GraphQL code, code gen. But we don't. So um, we're just going to let it create that code anyway. But what it's going to do, it's going to go ahead and uh, open a graphical editor, like uh, essentially like a local GraphQL server. And we should be able to test that out. And I think I'm running into uh, a problem there. So let me restart uh, our term. This is just a small uh, notification. <laughs> What's that? We're just at, we're at the end of the time slot, so it's done. Uh, okay, good, I got it. No, okay, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. We're we're, we're pretty much done anyway. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I don't think uh, it looks like my graph my my local GraphQL server is is giving me problems anyway, so I might not be able to to test this out. But essentially, this should uh, open up a GraphQL uh, server. You're able to test it out locally. Um, one app that I deployed uh, using this is this or that dot cloud, and you can go test this out. And you can uh, create a poll, and you can do stuff with it. Um, so uh, I've tested this thing out, um, and, and it's a real-time app. So if you kind of make a change, you should see it happen in real time. I've tested this thing out with uh, 1 million updates within about, I think it was like a one-minute period or something like that. And it, it worked beautifully. Like, it scaled enough. Um, and, I, and I think we've actually tested uh, Grok with uh, AppSync with up to, um, I think it was 50 million connected clients. And we uh, we were able to scale it to that point. We don't have exact metrics though on like how far it would scale, but uh, for for subscriptions, we we tested out with up to fifty million connected clients on a single API, and it, and it worked. So that's kind of the idea of like uh, the scalability type of thing. So that's kind of it. Um, I showed you the voting app. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, if you have any questions about this, I'm Dabit three D A B I T on Twitter, D A B I T, and the number three on Twitter. And that's it. Thank you. That that is fantastic. Um, if you don't follow Natter already, like he's got a ton of great uh, content. You've got some great YouTube videos on the exact same topic as well. So highly recommend you go follow him. Uh, the depth of knowledge there is really impressive. We need to hop to the Thank next you. speaker. So I'm going to say uh, at him in the chat if you have some specific questions or even just send him some messages as well. Uh, you can also add him at Twitter uh, so the whole world can benefit from that uh, dialogue. But um, yeah, thanks so much for, for coming. And uh, this, that's impressive stuff. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Uh, so the next one we've got is um, Sanka who is our uh, mystery speaker <laughs> because he came in the last minute to save the day. We had an unfortunate dropout um, and we wish that person well, uh, some, some issues. Um, but we really appreciate you coming in. Uh, I didn't know Glassdoor is in the middle of a dramatic GraphQL embracing the future uh, digitalization. So I'm super excited to hear about this. So Sanka, Director of Engineering at Glassdoor, uh, thank you for taking this uh, this uh, talking slot, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Jesse. Can you hear me fine? Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, guys. Um, so can you see the slides? Hopefully, yes. Uh, okay. So first of all, welcome, everyone, to the talk, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm Sanka, a Director of Engineering at Glassdoor. Um, I'm here to talk about the state of GraphQL at my company. I'd be happy to take any questions at the end of the talk. 
Um, I'm going to talk today about three specific things. Uh, number one, the state of adoption, uh, the path to federation, and our security posture. The intention is to keep the contents to the point, uh, and you should be able to follow me along uh, this look back, and it'll be more like a conversation around the state of GraphQL. Before we start, uh, so for folks who are not aware, Glassdoor, with its famous tagline, find the job that fits your life, uh, is a job and company site uh, that you can see company reviews, find jobs, salaries, and interviews data. It serves to 50 plus million monthly active users. Uh, it's launched in 21 countries. Uh, we have 65 million pieces of content and 20 million jobs. Uh, this is a pre-COVID number and non-unique jobs. Uh, high quality content and insights on 1 million plus companies in 190 countries. So that's a lot of data you can imagine. Uh, these are some of the UI experiences that you might have been familiar with already. Moving on, so I'm directly jumping onto adoption and uh, I'll start a little bit of the backstory and then move on from there. Um, so Glass, GraphQL at Glassdoor had a very humble start and we started with a content graph app, which looked something like this. And it had uh, connected itself directly to an employee data source and it was used to display employee information on the site. We started on this journey uh, with our flashy new pr uh, product called Know Your Worth that you might have used that enabled us to compute and showcase uh, what you should make based on the information you enter with us. It runs a bunch of machine learning algorithms, bunch of data sets that we already have, uh, and employers also share data with us, and then we use that to uh, you know, show this information. At start, the service was taking around 40,000 calls per minute. Front-end engineers were uh, amazed and loved the ability to get all the information in one request, and they had some extra bandwidth actually to make uh, time for working on page performance. A few months after this, uh, what we saw is a new tra path that we traversed, uh, very similar, but had a search service instead of databases. Um, so in this case, our brand new applicant management system for employers was built by connecting to uh, a search cluster. The call volumes of this was relatively low, so around 320 calls per minute, and the UI and everything looks something like this. This is mostly for our paid customers. Over the few months after this, uh, we started seeing Content Graph leading a promising path forward. 